I finally finished video number seven in my Serial Killers and Cult series. This one is about John Wayne Gacy, who tortured and murdered 33 young men and boys before finally being caught by police in Des Plaines, Illinois. Gacy became known as the Killer Clown. I found this video one of the more disturbing I've done so far. John Wayne Gacy was a serial killer and sex offender who raped, tortured, and murdered at least 33 young men and boys in Norwood Park Township near Chicago, Illinois during the 1970s. As with all the serial killers in my Serial Killer video series, he had a nickname, Killer Clown, because he worked as a clown at children's parties. When Gacy's execution approached, some people wore t-shirts with the slogan, No Tears for the Clown. Gacy would lure his victims to his home and show them how he could get out of a pair of handcuffs, a trick he used in his clown show. He would then con his victim into putting them on, telling them that he was going to teach them how to get out of the cuffs. Once his victim was subdued, he would then rape and torture his victims and then kill them by either asphyxiating them or strangling them with a ligature that he could twist. Many of Gacy's victims were teenage employees that he had developed a relationship with, which made it easier to convince them to try his handcuff and rope trick. He buried 26 of the victims in the crawl space of his house and after running out of room there, buried three elsewhere on his property with four being dumped into the Des Plaines River. John Wayne Gacy was born at Edgewater Hospital in Chicago, Illinois on March 17, 1942, the second of three children and the only son of John Stanley Gacy and Marion Elaine Robeson. His father named him after John Wayne, as he considered Wayne the epitome of American masculinity. He had two sisters, an older sister Joanne and a younger sister Karen. His father was a machinist and World War I veteran, and his mother was a homemaker. Gacy's father was an abusive alcoholic and wife beater. His sisters said Gacy Sr. had a Jekyll and Hyde personality. When Gacy was two, his mother Marion had only been home from the hospital for three weeks after giving birth to his younger sister Karen. His father came home one night and started smacking Marion around, knocking out a few of her teeth. Fleeing into the street in terror, Gacy Sr. ran after her and kept hitting her, knocking her to the sidewalk while leaving Gacy and his older sister crying inside the house. The police came and stopped the assault. Why wasn't Gacy Sr. arrested for domestic violence? Well, this was 1944. You always have to remember the time period. When Gacy was only four years old, his father beat him for getting into some car parts. When his mother tried to shield her son from the abuse, Gacy's father said he was a sissy and a mama's boy who would probably grow up queer. The same year, a family friend began to occasionally molest him. He kept this to himself, afraid that his father would blame him for the abuse. Despite all this, Gacy loved his father, but never felt he was good enough in his father's eyes. By the end of his grade school years, Gacy experienced fading spells and seizures, which landed him in the hospital on a few occasions. Then, in 1957, he suffered a burst appendix. Gacy later estimated that between the ages of 14 and 18, he had spent almost a year in the hospital and attributed the decline of his grades to missing so much school. Showing the parental empathy that he had become famous for, the elder Gacy accused his son of faking his condition as he lay in a hospital bed. Later on, as an adult, his friends chalked the fading spells up to recurrent heart trouble. At age 18, Gacy became involved in politics, working as an assistant precinct captain for a local Democratic Party candidate. Of course, even this development didn't satisfy the senior Gacy, 
who accused him of being a patsy. Gacy had already left high school, and trying to escape being constantly bullied by his father, he left home and drove to Las Vegas with a little over $130 to his name to stay with a cousin. Gacy worked at the Palm Mortuary and Ambulance Service in Las Vegas as a mortuary attendant for three months, picking up the bodies from the hospitals. He slept on a cot in the mortuary since he couldn't afford an apartment. George Wiekowski, the mortuary manager, remembers Gacy as polite and always cooperative, and it was unlikely that Gacy had much contact with the bodies since he slept in a different room from where the bodies were kept. His only contact was when he unloaded the bodies. Wiekowski added that there weren't any complaints against him. Returning to Chicago, Gacy took a management trainee position with the Nunn Bush Shoe Company. The following year, he was transferred to Springfield, Illinois, to work as a salesman, and was eventually promoted to department manager. After arriving in Springfield, he started dating Marlin Myers, a co-worker. They were married in September 1964, and Gacy's first son was born there. He gained a reputation as a hard worker and a devoted parent, and his future appeared bright. John Gacy, his wife, and young son moved to Waterloo, Iowa when Marlin's father purchased three Kentucky Fried Chicken franchises. The newlyweds moved into Marlin's parents' former home with Gacy managing the three franchises. Gacy's father-in-law, Fred Myers, wasn't too fond of his son-in-law and tried to convince his daughter to call off the wedding. He thought Gacy was full of himself, as well as a braggart and a liar. Myers made the franchise offer so he could be near his daughter and his grandson. Gacy would receive $15,000 per year, the equivalent of about $153,000 as of 2024, plus a share of the restaurant's profits. Sometimes Gacy passed himself off as the owner of the stores he was managing, further irritating Myers. Myers said he would have fired him if he weren't his son-in-law. While in Iowa, Gacy became involved with the Waterloo JCs. In addition to leadership skills the organization was developing, the Waterloo JCs were involved in more seedy enterprises, such as prostitution, pornography, and other vice activities. Gacy began sleeping around at this point and would often brag about his conquests. He also opened a club in his basement where his employees could drink alcohol and play pool. Although Gacy employed teenagers of both sexes, he socialized only with the males. He gave many of them alcohol before he made sexual advances. If they rebuffed him, he would claim his advances were jokes or a test of morals. Marlin gave birth to a son in February 1966 and a daughter in March of 1967. Gacy later described this period of his life as perfect as he had finally earned his father's approval. When Gacy's parents visited him in July of 1966, his father privately apologized for the abuse he had inflicted before happily saying, Son, I was wrong about you, as he shook Gacy's hand. Perhaps a day late and a dollar short, the damage may have already been done. As for his father-in-law, Fred Myers couldn't understand what Gacy was doing with all his money after learning that his wife was helping Marlin with her utility bills, increasing his distrust of Gacy. In the summer of 1967, 16-year-old Edward Lynch was working as a cook and dishwasher in one of the stores that Gacy managed. Gacy invited Lynch to his house to shoot pool and have a few drinks. His wife was in the hospital at the time after the delivery of their second child. After playing pool and having drinks, Gacy propositioned Lynch. After being rebuffed, Gacy pulled a knife and forced him into the bedroom, cutting him in the struggle. Gacy apologized and bandaged the boy's arm. Softening his tone, Gacy conned Lynch into chaining his hands behind his back and then began choking him. Lynch, playing dead, caused Gacy to stop. Gacy then agreed to take Lynch home. Lynch didn't go to the police, but confided in a friend. 
the friend that had a similar experience as Lynch would be Donald Voorhees. In August 1967, Gacy sexually assaulted 15-year-old Donald Voorhees, Jr., the son of Donald Edward Voorhees, a local politician and fellow J.C. Voorhees wasn't a full-time Gacy employee, but did various odd jobs for him. Gacy convinced Voorhees that he was commissioned to conduct homosexual experiments for scientific research and paid him up to $50 each. Often Gacy would get Voorhees drunk on whiskey and vodka before these so-called experiments took place. Then Gacy would debrief him by asking him about his feelings and reactions. Little did Voorhees know that he was not the only one involved in this little arrangement. Gacy threatened Voorhees with his so-called organized crime contacts in Chicago if he ever told anyone. This was a pretty standard threat that Gacy used against his teenage victims. Feeling ashamed and confused, in March of 1968, Voorhees, along with Lynch, finally told their parents that Gacy had sexually assaulted them. Gacy was arrested and charged with performing oral sodomy on Voorhees and the attempted assault of Edward Lynch. Gacy denied the charges and demanded to take a polygraph test, which he failed. Several of his fellow J.C.s found Gacy's story credible and rallied to his support. However, in spite of the J.C.'s support, on May 10, 1968, Gacy was indicted on sodomy charges. On August the 30th, Gacy gave one of his employees, 18-year-old Russell Schroeder, $300 to assault Voorhees to stop him from testifying against him in court. Schroeder lured Voorhees to a park, sprayed him with mace, and then beat him up. He escaped and reported Schroeder's actions to police. Schroeder was arrested the next day and denied he did anything wrong, but later unraveled like a cheap suit and confessed to assaulting Voorhees, throwing Gacy under the bus. Police then arrested Gacy and charged him with hiring Schroeder to assault Voorhees. After this incident, his support among the J.C.'s caved. On September 12, 1968, Gacy was ordered to undergo a psychiatric evaluation at the University of Iowa Psychiatric Hospital. The evaluation concluded that he had antisocial personality disorder and then his behavior was likely to bring him into repeated conflict with society. However, the ruling was that Gacy was mentally competent to stand trial. On November 7, 1968, Gacy pled guilty to one count of sodomy in relation to Voorhees, but not guilty to the other charges. He claimed Voorhees had offered himself to him and that he had acted out of curiosity. Of course, no one believed that line, and Gacy was convicted of sodomy and sentenced to 10 years in prison to be served at the Anamosa State Penitentiary. Deciding to cut her losses, Gacy's wife, Marlene, petitioned for divorce, requesting that she be awarded the couple's home and property, sole custody of their two children, and alimony. The divorce was finalized September the 18th, 1969. Gacy never saw Marlene or his children again. During his incarceration, Gacy was a model prisoner, but when his parole hearing came up in June of 1969, parole was denied. On Christmas Day, 1969, Gacy's father died from cirrhosis of the liver. When he requested supervised compassionate leave to attend the funeral, it was denied. Gacy's next parole hearing was in May of 1970. To prepare for the hearing, he completed 16 high school courses and obtained his diploma in November of 1969. On June the 18th, 1970, Gacy was granted parole after serving 21 months of a 10-year sentence. The conditions of Gacy's probation were that he relocate to Chicago to live with his mother and observe a 10 p.m. curfew. He arrived in Chicago by bus on June the 19, 1970 and obtained a job as a short-order cook 
in downtown Chicago at Bruna's Restaurant, managed by family friend Eugene Bashelli. Bashelli soon noticed that Gacy was associating with men who were gay. Gacy went into business with 21-year-old Michael Reed doing painting and maintenance work on the side while still at Bruna's. Gacy had picked up Reed, who was just discharged from the Army during his cruising activities. Finding little storage space for his materials at his mother's apartment and with financial assistance from her, Gacy bought a ranch-style house at 8213 West Somerdale Avenue in Norwood Park Township, Illinois, part of metropolitan Chicago. Reed moved in with the Gacy's, but after Gacy attacked him with a hammer, Reed moved out. He never reported the incident to police, but would appear later as a witness during the Gacy trial. On February 12, 1971, Gacy was charged with sexually assaulting a teenage boy. The boy claimed he had lured him into his car at Chicago's Greyhound bus terminal and taken him to his home, where he had attempted to rape him. The court dismissed the complaint when the boy failed to appear in court. On June 22, Gacy was arrested again and charged with aggravated sexual battery in response to a complaint filed by a boy who claimed that Gacy had flashed a sheriff's badge, lured him into his car, and forced him to perform oral sex. These charges were dropped after the boy attempted to blackmail Gacy. The Iowa Parole Board never learned of these incidents, so Gacy's parole was never revoked. This would be the first of many missed opportunities for the Chicago police to stop Gacy. His parole ended on October 18, 1971, and a month later, the records of his criminal convictions in Iowa were sealed. In August 1971, Gacy became engaged to Carol Hoff, a woman that he had briefly dated in high school. Carol and her two young daughters from a previous marriage moved into the house soon after. After they were married, Gacy's mother got her own apartment and moved out of the house after her relationship with her son became strained. Gacy started a part-time construction business called PDM Contractors. With the approval of his probation officer, Gacy worked evenings on his construction contracts while working as a cook during the day. Initially, he undertook minor repair work but later expanded it to include projects such as interior design, remodeling, and landscaping. In mid-1973, Gacy quit his job as a cook so he could commit fully to his construction business. By 1975, PDM was expanding rapidly and Gacy was working up to 16 hours per day and often would return home in the early morning hours. Carol observed Gacy bringing teenage boys into his garage after he came home and also found gay pornography and men's wallets with identification inside the house. When she confronted Gacy about these items, he told her that it was none of her business. Carol consistently complained about the odor from the crawl space, and it was especially bad in the bathroom. She wanted to call an exterminator, but Gacy nixed that idea and spread more lime in the crawl space to try and kill the stench. Toward the end of their dying marriage, the couple went weeks without even speaking. With nothing to salvage in the marriage, Carol asked Gacy for a divorce, and it was finalized on March 2, 1977. They had been married six years. In March of 1977, Gacy became a supervisor for PE Systems, a firm specializing in the remodeling of drugstores. Between PE Systems and PDM, Gacy was involved in up to four projects simultaneously and frequently traveled to other states. By 1978, PDM's annual income was over $200,000. John Wayne Gacy became known as the Killer Clown because in 1975, he became a member of the Jolly Joker Clown Club, whose members, dressed as clowns, would perform at fundraising events and parades. Gacy created his own characters, Pogo the Clown and Patches the Clown, devising his own makeup and costumes. Gacy performed as both Pogo and Patches at numerous local parties, political functions, and in charitable events. 
Gacy is also known to have gone to his favorite drinking venue, the Good Luck Lounge, dressed as a clown on several occasions, with the explanation that he had just performed as Pogo and was stopping for a drink before heading home. Gacy participated in local Democratic Party politics, initially offering the use of his employees, who were mostly teenagers, to clean party headquarters at no charge. He was rewarded with an invitation to serve on the Norwood Park Township Street Lighting Committee, subsequently earning the title of precinct captain. In 1975, Gacy was appointed director of Chicago's annual Polish Constitution Day Parade. Through his work with the parade, which he would supervise until 1978, Gacy met and was photographed with First Lady Rosalind Carter, wearing an S-pin, indicating a person given special clearance. After his arrest, the event later became an embarrassment to the United States Secret Service. Gacy murdered his first victim in 1972 and murdered two more by the end of 1975. After his divorce from Carol in 1976, he murdered at least 30 victims. He buried 26 of them in the crawl space of his house. Gacy's victims included people he knew and random individuals, lured from Chicago's Greyhound bus station. He cruised Washington State Park, nicknamed Bughouse Square for his victims, or just pick them up off the streets where he would promise employment, an offer of alcohol or drugs, or money for sex. Some victims were grabbed by force. Others were conned into believing Casey was a policeman. Casey usually lured a lone victim to his house, although on more than one occasion, Casey had what he called doubles, two boys killed in the same evening. Once Gacy got the victim to his home, he would offer him alcohol, drugs, or gain his trust in other ways. He would then produce a pair of handcuffs to show a magic trick that he used in his clown routine. He typically cuffed his own hands behind his back, then released himself with a hidden key, and then offered to show his intended victim the trick. With his victim restrained, Gacy proceeded to rape and torture him. He frequently manacled his captive's ankles to a two-by-four with handcuffs attached to each end, an act inspired by the Houston mass murderer Dean Corll, taunting his victims throughout their abuse. Gacy typically murdered his victims by placing a rope around their neck and tightening it like a tourniquet with a hammer handle. He referred to this as the rope trick, frequently informing his victim, this is the last trick. Sometimes the victim convulsed for an hour or two before dying, although several victims died of asphyxiation from cloth stuffed deep into their throats. Gacy usually stored the victim's corpses under his bed for up to 24 hours before burying them in the crawl space, where he periodically poured quicklime to speed up decomposition. Robert Peast was Gacy's last victim. The investigation into his disappearance led to Gacy's arrest on December 21, 1978. Unlike the other Gacy victims, the police didn't assume that Peast was a runaway. Peast was a 15-year-old Maine West High School honor student and athlete that lived in Des Plaines, Illinois. He was two merit badges away from becoming an Eagle Scout and was working on a community project to clean up the Des Plaines River in order to earn them. Peace worked part-time at Nissan's pharmacy along with his friend and classmate Kim Byers. The pharmacy owners, Phil and Larry Torf, hired teenagers to stock shelves and work the register. Peace had only been working there for a few months and had gotten the job when his mother had sent him there to pick up some milk. Byers was working that day and asked him if he wanted a job. Phil Torf later hired him at $2.35 an hour. Once Peace started working, Rob and his mother had a regular routine. Mrs. Peace would pick him up from school around 5.30 after Rob had finished his extracurricular activities. She brought him a hot dinner and he would eat it on the way to Nissan's, 
and then would stock shelves from 6 to 9 p.m. She would then pick him up at 9 p.m. and take him home. Peast and Byers were both working the night of December the 11th, 1978. Peast had let Byers wear his parka as she was cold because of a draft through a door at the pharmacy. The door wouldn't seal properly and had been a problem for some time. On that night, Gacy stopped by to talk to Phil Torf about some remodeling that would take care of the air leakage problems caused by the door. Gacy, a local contractor, had done some work for Torf a few years before. Gacy ran his company, PDM Contractors, out of his home, which was not far from Torf's pharmacy. His company was very successful, and his business had taken him to several states. On arriving at Nissan's that night, Gacy took notes and measurements of the pharmacy so he could give Torf an estimate of the work. Torf liked Gacy because he was willing to do the work at night, and the pharmacy could then stay open during the day. While he was within earshot of peace, Gacy mentioned he often hired teenage boys at a starting wage of $5 an hour, almost double the pay Peast earned at Nissan's. Peast was not in the best mood that night as he had asked Torf for a raise and Torf refused. He was trying to save up for a Jeep and had $900 squirreled away so far. At about 9 p.m., Peast had asked Byers to watch the register so he could take out the trash, so he asked for his parka. Earlier, she had sold some photo prints to a customer and had forgotten to give them the receipt, so she stuck it in the pocket of the parka. This would be an important piece of evidence for the Des Plaines police. Later, while investigating Peace's disappearance, police found that same receipt in a trash can at Gacy's house that Byers had stuck in the pocket of the parka. At 8.45 p.m., Gacy, finishing up his quotes for the job, left the pharmacy and headed to his truck. Peace's mother, Elizabeth, arrived just minutes later to pick him up so that the family could celebrate her birthday. Peace told his mother that he had to finish up stocking a few items, so his mother wandered around the store. After finishing, Peace noticed that Gacy was still outside in his truck and saw his opportunity so he went to the register to retrieve his parka. He asked his mother to wait, saying he was going outside to talk to a contractor about a job. He left the store at 9 o'clock p.m., promising, I'll be right back. Later, Phil Torf, seeing Byers at the register alone, asked where Peast was. Byers told him that he was outside talking to that guy that was in here. At 9.20, with no sign of her son, Mrs. Peast left and told Byers to have him call her when he returned to the pharmacy. She returned home about 9.25. As the night went on, Mrs. Peast called Nissan's and got Kim Byers on the line. She asked Byers the name of the contractor that her son was talking to. Byers replied, John Gacy. Rob's dad, Harold Peast, obtained Gacy's phone number and called his home. There was no answer. The next morning, Harold and Elizabeth Peast went to the Des Plaines Police Station, a 10-minute drive from the Peast house. At the station, a missing persons report was filed with a watch officer who called Phil Torf at the pharmacy to see if he had any information. He didn't. At 11.50, the missing persons report was sent to the radio room. Rob Peast had been missing 14 hours. After searching for their son all night, the next day, the Peasts went back to the police station and met with youth officer Ronald Adams. The Peasts gave Adams a copy of the Maine West High School student telephone directory, the dial tone. Adams noted that Rob had underlined the names of his friends in the directory. A missing kid who is an honor student who underlines his friends' names in his school directory from an intact, loving family who disappeared on his mother's birthday. Mrs. Peast also passed along a photo of Rob taken in downtown Chicago with his new 35 millimeter camera that his father had bought him. The police would lift Rob's prints off of this camera. In the photo, he was wearing his blue parka and tan pants, 
the same clothes that he was last seen in when he disappeared. This didn't seem like a runaway to Adams. Adams called Phil Torf, Gacy, and Kim Byers and interviewed the three of them. Gacy denied he had ever spoken to Peast or offered him a job. Byers confirmed that Peast had told her he was going to go talk to Gacy, but had not seen them together. Adams pursued the investigation further by obtaining the name of the company Gacy owned, PDM Contractors, and his home address, 8213 Somerdale Avenue in Northwood Park on the outskirts of Chicago. Even though Mr. and Mrs. Peast were told not to get involved, they drove to Gacy's house and parked looking for clues. Fortunately, they elected not to go in. Finally, not seeing anything that would give them any clues, they left, unaware that the body of their son was inside the house. The Des Plaines police, meanwhile, had started taking a closer look at Gacy and his past life and found that it was not so squeaky clean. After calling Chicago Police Headquarters, Adams was able to find that Gacy had been paroled to Chicago from Waterloo, Iowa, and that he had been in prison there for sodomy on 15-year-old Donald Voorhees. Adams sent another detective, James Pickle, to Gacy's house and the Christmas tree lot that he owned. Adams would interview Peace High School friends. After looking further, they found that Gacy faced charges of assault and reckless conduct, but these charges were dropped when Gacy's victim tried to shake him down for money. He had also been charged in the past for prostitution. In March of 1978, Gacy assaulted and raped Jeffrey Rignall, who pressed charges. The case was still pending as of December of 1978. The Chicago police would end up with more than a few pointed questions concerning this and why the Iowa Parole Board was never notified. On December 13, 1978, District Attorney Terry Sullivan was contacted by Lieutenant Joseph Kosensack asking for advice on handling the Rob Peast missing persons case. After going over Gacy's arrest records and the information gathered so far, the question remained, if Gacy had abducted Rob Peast, what had he done with him? Peast friends and co-workers began helping out as well by distributing flyers and interviewing people in the area. Nissan's pharmacy turned into a hangout for concerned friends and classmates. Kosensack and two Des Plaines police officers visited Gacy at his home. Gacy indicated he had asked one of the youths working at the pharmacy, whom he believed to be Peast, whether there were any remodeling materials behind the store, but denied that he had offered him a job. He had only returned to the pharmacy because he had left his appointment book. Gacy promised to come to the police station to make a statement. On returning to the police station later that day, Gacy denied any involvement in Peace disappearance and repeated that he had not offered him a job. Gacy reiterated that he had returned to the pharmacy in response to a phone call from Torf informing him he had left his appointment book at the store. Detectives had already spoken with Torf, who denied calling Gacy. At the request of detectives, Gacy prepared a written statement detailing his movements on December the 11th. Suspecting Gacy might be holding peace at his home, Des Plaines police obtained a search warrant on December the 13th. Seven Des Plaines police officers searched Gacy's home. Nothing about the home was warm or inviting. Paintings of clowns were on the wall. Lieutenant Kozensack found the first important item in a trash can, the photo receipt from Nissan's that Kim Byers had stuck in her pocket. While the police were searching Gacy's residence, one of his teenage employees, David Cram, showed up and got a soft drink from the refrigerator. He watched while police finished gathering the things they needed and seemed to know the place quite well. The search revealed several suspicious items, including several police badges, a starter pistol, a syringe and hypodermic needle, handcuffs, books on homosexuality and pederasty, pornographic films, capsules of amyl nitrate, a dildo, 
a 2x4 with two holes drilled into each end, several driver's licenses, a blue hooded parka, and underwear too small to fit Gacy. They also found a class ring from Maine West High School engraved with the initials J.A.S. and a Nissan Pharmacy photo receipt in a trash can, alongside a 36-inch section of nylon rope. The Des Plaines police confiscated Gacy's Oldsmobile and other PDM work vehicles. Surveillance teams known as the Delta Unit, consisting of officers Mike Albrecht, David Hochmeister, Ron Robinson, and Robert Schultz, monitor Gacy as the investigation continued. During their search, the investigators almost missed the trap door in the floor beneath the closet. It opened into a dark space beneath the house, the crawl space. Looking down into the space with a the flashlight, they found hard earth along with lime. Chicago police got a call from a gas station attendant that a man had driven off without paying for his gas. The attendant had gotten the plate number, which led to a house in Des Plaines and to John Zick. Zick's parents told the police that their son had been missing since January of 1977. Checking out the title of the car, a white Plymouth satellite, led Chicago police to a man named Michael Rossi. After finding him, Rossi told the police that his employer, John Gacy, would clear things up. Gacy told police that he had purchased the car from Zick for $300 because he needed the money to go to California. Gacy then sold it to Rossi for payments of $50 a month until the balance was paid. Rossi stole the gas because he was broke. Gacy offered to pay the gas station attendant for all of his trouble. No more updates on the report were made, and a connection to Gacy and the disappearance of Zick were yet to be made by the Chicago police. On December 14, 1978, Des Plaines detectives Raphael Tovar and James Ryan went to Rossi's home and, while waiting for him, spoke with his wife. Keeping an eye peeled for Rossi, Tovar asked his wife what kind of car he drove. A white Plymouth satellite, she said. Rossi's wife told Ryan and Tovar that Gacy seemed weird and was always trying to get her husband to leave her. Gacy would call and tell her that her husband was running around with other women. She said she had been to Gacy's house and that she had seen some weird things. Among them was a board with chains on it. Rossi arrived home as Ryan and Tovar were getting ready to leave and they took him to the station for questioning. Rossi told them that Gacy had something on his mind and had withdrawn $4,000 from the bank in case he needed bond. Gacy had asked Rossi not to badmouth him in any way. Rossi told them that when he was hired, Gacy had asked about his sexual preferences. He told them he was straight and if there were any strings, he wouldn't take the job, so Gacy dropped the subject. Pharmacist Phil Torf, for his part, remarked that Rossi and Gacy were unusually close. On December 14th, Des Plaines police arrived at the home of Richard and Rosemary Zick. The Zicks lived four minutes from Nissan's pharmacy and five from the home of Rob Peast. The investigators told Rosemary that they wanted to talk to her about her son. They had traced him to this address through the Maine West High School class ring that they had found in Gacy's house. Rose Marie told them her son had been missing since January of 1977. After taking notes, the detectives would only tell the family that they were working on an ongoing investigation and could not comment. Mrs. Zick turned over all of John's personal papers to Des Plaines Police to help in their investigation. From Zick's address book, the investigators were able to determine that most of the addresses came from a gay neighborhood in Chicago. He also had a phone number for a gay hotline. By the end of the day on the 15th, Des Plaines investigators had gotten John Zick's missing persons report and saw the notation about the 1976 Plymouth satellite, now in the possession of Michael Rossi. On that same day, Des Plaines investigators obtained the Chicago Police Department's records on Gacy. Gacy's last arrest was on July 15, 
1978, and was for battery. By December 15th, detectives were able again to catch up with Michael Rossi. He had met Gacy in 1976 after Rossi had dropped out of high school to work with a plumber who had taken a job at Gacy's Summerdale house. During the visit, Gacy offered Rossi more money than he was making in his present job if he would go to work for him. Later on, Rossi moved in with him. When the Des Plaines police quizzed Rossi about the Plymouth satellite, Rossi said Gacy told him about a friend that was trying to sell his car for money so he could move to California. Together, Gacy and Rossi drove to a parking lot in Bughouse Square where the car was parked. After Rossi took it for a test drive, he said he'd buy it, with the agreed price being $50 a month until paid off. John Zick's signature on the title was obviously forged, but the Des Plaines cops couldn't prove it. In an interview with Gacy's ex-wife, Carol Hoff, they learned of the disappearance of John Butkovich. She also told investigators that her ex-husband told her he was bisexual, but she was convinced he was leaning toward the gay lifestyle. By the time they were divorced, he was open about his sexual preference. After she moved out, Michael Rossi moved in. Des Plaines police put Gacy under 24-hour surveillance, and he proceeded to make a game out of trying to lose them. Sometimes, when he was at a restaurant or bar, he would have the waiter send him drinks. Back at headquarters, no one was buying anyone any drinks. The team there continued to search through the items collected from Gacy's home, and three trained search dogs had been prepared by sniffing articles of peace clothing. These dogs were used to search the vehicles that had been impounded to determine whether Peace had been present in any of them. The dogs skipped over Gacy's pickup truck and his van, but lay down on the seat of Gacy's car, indicating the presence of human remains. Another team at the station were starting to piece together other boys and young men who entered Gacy's life. Michael Rossi had mentioned a Gacy employee, Greg Godzik, who was also missing and hadn't been seen since December of 1976, disappearing only weeks before John Zick. Another investigator found that a body had been recovered in the Illinois River with a Tim Lee tattoo and had been identified as Timothy O'Rourke, last seen at his uptown apartment in the fall of 1977. Dale Landigan had been found in the Des Plaines River two weeks prior to that. It seemed that bodies were now piling up. By December 18th, Gacy was becoming stressed out with the game and started drinking heavily. That afternoon, he drove to meet with his lawyers, Leroy Stevens and Sam Amarante, to prepare a $750,000 civil suit against the Des Plaines police for harassment, demanding that they stop their surveillance. The same day, the Nissan pharmacy photo receipt found in Gacy's kitchen was traced to 17-year-old Kim Byers, a classmate of Peace, the same Kim Byers who worked with him at Nissan Pharmacy. Byers stated that she had borrowed Peace Parker earlier in the evening because she was cold. She confirmed that the receipt found at Gacy's house was hers, and she had put it in the pocket of the jacket. Peace took the jacket back when he left the store. That was confirmation that Robert Peace was in Gacy's house, and with this information, the police were able to obtain a second search warrant. After obtaining the second search warrant, officers arrived at Gacy's house for the second search of the premises. One of the officers went into the bathroom and, while flushing Gacy's toilet, noticed a smell that he recognized. The odor in the morgue, the smell of rotting corpses emanating from a heating duct. The officers who had searched Gacy's house previously had failed to notice this, as the house had been cold. On the evening of December the 20th, Gacy drove to his lawyer's office in Park Ridge to attend a scheduled meeting, supposedly to discuss the progress of his civil suit. He seemed nervous and immediately asked for a drink. Sam Amarati got a bottle of Seagram's whiskey and Gacy drank two glasses. He then asked what Gacy wanted to talk to him about. 
Gacy picked up a copy of the Chicago Daily Herald and pointed to the front page article about the disappearance of Rob East and said, This boy is dead. He's dead. He's in the river. Gacy then proceeded to give a lengthy confession that continued into the early hours of the following morning. He confessed that he had murdered at least 30 young men and boys, most of whom he had buried in his crawl space, and had disposed of five other bodies in the Des Plaines River. Gacy dismissed his victims as male prostitutes, hustlers, and liars, adding that he sometimes woke up to find dead, strangled kids with their hands cuffed behind their back. He had buried their bodies in his crawl space, as he believed they were his property. As a result of the alcohol he had consumed, Gacy fell asleep midway through his confession. Amarante immediately arranged a psychiatric evaluation for him that morning. On awakening several hours later, Gacy shook his head when informed by Amarante that he had confessed to killing approximately 30 people, saying, Well, I can't think about this right now. I've got things to do. Ignoring his lawyer's advice to attend the scheduled evaluation, Gacy left to attend to whatever business he felt he needed to attend to. Gacy later said his memories of his final day of freedom were hazy, adding that he knew his arrest was inevitable and that he intended to visit his friends and say his farewells. After leaving his lawyer's office, Gacy drove to a gas station where he handed a small bag of cannabis to the attendant, who immediately handed the bag to the surveillance officers. Gacy then drove to the home of a fellow contractor and friend, Ronald Rode. Gacy hugged Rode before bursting into tears and saying, I've been a bad boy. I killed 30 people, give or take a few. Rode thought he was joking. The surveillance officers noted he was holding a rosary to his chin, praying while he drove along the expressway. As Gacy drove to various locations that morning, police outlined the formal draft of their second search warrant, specifically to search for Peace body in the crawl space. On hearing from the surveillance detectives that Gacy might be about to commit suicide, police decided to arrest him on a charge of possession and distribution of marijuana in order to hold him in custody until they got the warrant. At 4.30 p.m. on December the 21st, the eve of the hearing of Gacy's civil suit, a second search warrant was granted. After police informed Gacy of their intentions to search his crawl space for the body of Peast, Gacy denied the teenager was buried there, but confessed to having killed in self-defense a young man whose body was buried under his garage. Armed with the signed search warrant, police and evidence technicians drove to Gacy's home. They found that Gacy had unplugged his sump pump, flooding the crawl space with water. They replaced the plug and waited for the water to drain. Evidence technician Daniel Genty then entered the crawl space and began digging. Within minutes, he uncovered putrefied flesh and a human arm bone. Ginty shouted to the investigators that they could charge Gacy with murder, adding, I think this crawl space is full of kids. The first victim was too decomposed to be Robert Peast. As the body in the northeast corner was unearthed, a crime scene technician discovered the skull of a second victim alongside this body. Later excavations of the feet of this second victim revealed a further skull beneath the body. Because of this, Technicians returned to the trench where the first body was unearthed, discovering the rib cage of a fourth victim, confirming the scale of the murders. At this point, Genty and the police decided to wait for the Cook County Medical Examiner, Dr. Robert Stein. In the early morning hours of December 22nd, and in the presence of his lawyers, Gacy provided a formal statement in which he confessed to murdering about 30 young men and boys, all of whom he claimed had entered his house willingly. He said that he had buried most of the bodies in the crawl space beneath his house. 
Gacy claimed to have dug only five of the graves in this location and had his teenage employees dig the remaining trenches so that he would have graves available. He described conning his victims into the handcuff trick, then while helpless, strangling them. Sometimes if Gacy had developed a relationship with his victim, they would put the rope around their own neck, anticipating the trick on how to get loose. The killings escalated in 1976, after which Gacy lost count. He claimed some nights he had killed two people and that none of his victims were tortured. Gacy said during the murder of one of his victims, he read the 23rd Psalm before twisting the rope the final time. One of the officers asked where Gacy got the idea for the board with the chains and shackles. That guy in Texas, Elmer Way Henley, he replied. In the crawl space, he soaked the bodies in acid or put lime on them, covering them with a foot of dirt. The last five victims were killed in 1978 and dumped into the Des Plaines River off of Interstate 55. During his confession, Gacy showed no signs of remorse. Robert Peast was murdered shortly after 10 p.m. on December the 11th at Gacy's home. After he was charged with Rob Peast's murder, Gacy was taken to an interview room to give a statement. Gacy said that he had come back to Nissan's pharmacy to pick up his appointment book, as he had forgotten it when he was at the store earlier. When he left the drug store, he saw Rob Peast come out the door and motioned for him to get into his car. Peast told him that he wanted to discuss a job. Since Peast only had half an hour, Gacy said they would drive and talk. When they arrived at Gacy's house, he propositioned Peast telling him he was somewhat of a liberal when it came to sex. Seeing that was going nowhere, he changed his pitch and talked about dressing as a clown and showed Peace some clown tricks that he performed using handcuffs and what he called a rope trick. Gacy then duped Priest into donning handcuffs, at which point he became, in Gacy's words, distressed. Gacy began to sexually assault Peace, at which time Peace began crying. Then he said he only had one more thing to show Rob, the rope trick. Gacy said he put the cord around Peace's neck and twisted it twice, but was interrupted by a phone call from a business acquaintance. He talked on the phone as Peace lay convulsing on the floor. He also admitted to having slept alongside Peace's body that evening. The next day, Gacy was visited by officers Kozensock and Pickle while the boy's body lay in the attic. After the officers left, Gacy disposed of the corpse in the Des Plaines River by dumping it over the rail of the bridge. Gacy requested that his sister Karen be brought to the interrogation room, so she was picked up from her home and brought to the station by law enforcement. As she sobbed hysterically, Gacy finished his confession while his lawyer, Sam Amarante, walked in the corridor in a daze. Accompanied by police, his lawyers, and his sister Karen, Gacy was driven to the I-55 bridge on December 23rd to find the spot where he confessed to having thrown the body of Robert Peast and four other victims into the river. Gacy was then taken to his house, and by that time a large crowd of curiosity seekers had gathered, as well as the press. The police had roped off Gacy's property and erected barriers, closing the street to all except residential traffic and police vehicles. One of the police officers gave Gacy a can of spray paint and instructed him to mark his garage floor to show where he had buried 18-year-old John Butkovich. Back at police headquarters, Gacy drew a diagram of his basement to indicate where other bodies were buried, using a line to designate each grave. John Wayne Gacy was charged with the murder of Rob Peast, and was denied bail, with a preliminary hearing set for December 29, 1978. He was transferred to the Cook County Department of Corrections and sent to Cermak Hospital, the medical wing of the jail, at his attorney's request. Once he arrived, he was isolated from other inmates. The body of Robert Peast was finally found on April 9, 1979, 
after the spring thaw caused the rivers and lakes to melt. Near the Dresden Dam, a man walking along a towpath discovered a decomposed body tangled in roots near the locks on the edge of the Illinois River. The body was identified via dental records the same evening. An autopsy revealed that paper-like material had been shoved down Pease's throat, causing him to suffocate. On April 18, 1979, Robert Pease was buried in a mausoleum vault at All Saints Cemetery with a funeral mass taking place at the Lady of Hope Roman Catholic Church. Along with the Peast family, 300 students and faculty from Maine West High School, as well as the Des Plaines Police involved in the investigation, attended. The recovery operation started on December 22, 1978. Twenty-six bodies were recovered by investigators from Gacy's crawl space over Christmas week. Three others were uncovered elsewhere on his property. Evidence technicians Daniel Genty and Carl Humbert went down into the crawl space and began excavating it. Since the connective tissue had decomposed, the skeletal remains weren't intact, and those digging through the muck of the crawl space handed up what they thought to be bones to the technicians, and they would be passed to Chief Medical Examiner Robert Stein. Some of the boys wore jewelry such as a bracelet welded around a wrist, and some had shoes on their feet. As the excavation continued, they found that Gacy had a burial system, so to speak. At the feet of one body lay the skull of another. At the end of the first day, one body and part of another had been recovered. Several days after bodies number three and four were recovered, they were identified using dental records, as most had decomposed to the point of skeletonization. Body three was John Zick, and body number four was Greg Gotzik both sharing a common grave. After four bodies were discovered, the recovery effort was suspended for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. The daily ritual was reporting the body count. At the end of the day, Dr. Robert Stein stepped out on the front lawn of Gacy's house in front of reporters, photographers, and curiosity seekers and gave the statistics for the day. The team returned after Christmas and continued the recovery operation. On December 26, the total was six from the house and one in the river. The next day, eight more, bringing the total to 18, and the next day, four more, and six the next day, bringing the total to 28. Gacy's body count tied Houston mass murderer Dean Coral. When James Mazzara was pulled from the Des Plaines River, Gacy became the worst mass murderer in U.S. history. Once the remains were removed, Dr. Stein pronounced them dead, assigned a morgue identification number, and put them in body bags to be transported to the Cook County morgue. There, staff members had the job of identifying the remains. Since the bodies were so decomposed and there was no DNA identification back in those days, dental records were the most common source of identification. As spring rolled around and the weather improved, investigators did a final sweep of the property. As the Grandall operator was clearing the area, he smelled something odd. Upon investigating, Genty discovered another body, wrapped in dry cleaner and garbage bags. This body was wearing a wedding ring. About a week later, the final body was found under Gacy's dining room, probably there six years, while above the buried corpse, he ate and entertained friends and acquaintances. Gacy, for his part, looked like an everyman and had a talent for conning young men and boys to do what he wanted to the point where they couldn't escape. During his interviews with authorities, he gave his reasons for killing each one of them at one part calling them human garbage. These interviews can be taken with a grain of salt as truth-telling wasn't one of Gacy's strong points. For years, he bragged about how important he was. He claimed he advised Chicago Mayor Richard Daley. He didn't. He married the daughter of Colonel Sanders. Nope. His cousin was a leading crime syndicate figure. Not true. 
lying for self-aggrandizement was so easy for him. Investigators found that Gacy was a common sight at gay bars and was known as a chicken hawk, an older man who looks for young men and boys. Some thought he was a cop, and he had a badge and drove a dark car with a flashing red light. Fake police badges were found at Gacy's home. In June of 1981, there were nine unidentified victims. They were buried, with expenses being paid for, by the funeral directors of Greater Chicago, with the inscription, We Are Remembered, engraved on their tombstones. They were interred in various cemeteries throughout Chicago. In 2011, Sheriff Tom Dart announced the reopening of the Gacy case to try to re-identify the remaining victims using DNA, which was not available back in the 1970s. The number of identified victims now stands at four as of 2024, then went up to five when Michael Moreno's mother, doubting that his identification was correct, had the body exhumed. DNA tests found that the body in the grave was not that of her son. In the second week of January, a Cook County grand jury indicted Gacy on seven counts of murder for the six victims that had been identified so far, as well as Rob Peast. On January the 10th, Sam Almirante, Gacy's attorney, entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity, with the case being assigned to Louis B. Garippo. Garippo was a former state's attorney who had helped prosecute Richard Speck, so this wasn't his first high-profile case to be involved in. On April 23, 1979, a Cook County grand jury indicted Gacy on 26 more counts of murder, with opening statements heard on Wednesday, February the 6th, 1980, at the Criminal Court Building in Cook County, Illinois. Metal detectors were in the lobby to ensure the safety of everyone at the proceedings. One victim's father had planned on bringing a gun, but thought the better of it when he saw the increased security around the building. It was the district attorney's job to prove that John Gacy wasn't insane when he committed his crimes. Prosecutor Terry Sullivan was concerned about the selected jury having the mindset of, well, to do all that, he must be nuts. Well, maybe, but not in the legal sense of the word. Gacy's psychiatric evaluation for the prosecution found that he didn't exhibit any mental illness or defect that prevented him from understanding what he was doing. For example, his digging of the graves in his crawl space in advance showed premeditation. The psychiatric evaluation found Gacy to be an egocentric narcissist, exhibiting sexual deviation as well as a sociopath who blamed others for his actions. Gacy employees David Cram and Michael Rossi testified that Gacy had made them dig drainage trenches and spread bags of lime in his crawl space. Both said Gacy looked periodically into the crawl space to ensure they and other employees they supervised did not deviate from the precise locations he had marked. David Cram was a high school dropout who had been kicked out of his parents' house. Cram had met Gacy on July 26, 1976, when Gacy picked him up hitchhiking and offered him a job. Being practically homeless and broke, Cram took him up on the offer and moved in, with Gacy paying his living expenses. Cram would testify that Gacy had a well-stocked bar and a stash of drugs that he, as well as the other teenage employees, had access to. The drugs were lifted from the pharmacies that Gacy did his construction work for, and were hidden in various places around the house. Gacy would take speed every day to try to lose weight and was a casual smoker of marijuana. At one point, Cram, cleaning out the garage, found some wallets with IDs in them. He asked Gacy if he could use one so that he could go out drinking. Gacy said, sure, I don't want those. 
those are from some deceased persons. Cram continued living with Gacy, but moved out that year. He continued to work for Gacy off and on in 1977, and in August of that year started digging trenches for pipes in Gacy's crawl space to be installed by a plumber. Cram denied that he had helped Gacy bury any of the bodies in the crawl space. After each witness identified a victim, the photo was shown to the jurors. The prosecution talked about their life and the circumstances of their disappearance, and then attached the photo to a 4x8 board with the name of each victim underneath. The defense succeeded in keeping all the photos off the board at once, with the grounds that it was inflammatory. The prosecutor was able to put each photo on the board while they were talking about that particular victim, but then had to take it down. This left the names of the victims under each blank space. This strategy had the unintended effect of making the blank spaces look like little coffins. This board became known as the Gallery of Grief. Final arguments by the prosecution and defense began on March the 11th, 1980. After closing arguments, Sullivan and his team went to Jeans, a popular bar for attorneys, to wait for the jury's decision. The bell rang at the bar, indicating that the verdict was in. It had only been one hour and fifty minutes, so there was some confusion. Was this in regard to another trial that was going on? Then someone said, the Gacy jury is in. John Wayne Gacy was found guilty on 33 counts of murder. He was also found guilty of sexual assault and taking indecent liberties with a child, both in reference to Robert Peast. 35 indictments total. His conviction for the 33 murders were the most in United States history by one person. At the end, he was killing one kid every 11 days. Judge Garippo warned the gallery in advance to control their emotions when the verdicts were being read, but he might as well have been talking to a wall. When the first verdict was read, there was cheering and clapping in the gallery, while Judge Garippo pounded his gavel. D.A. William Kunkel later learned that most of the two hours that the jury spent in the jury room was spent signing each of the verdict sheets. In the presence of attorneys and the victims' families, John Wayne Gacy was sentenced to death on March 13, 1980. On being sentenced, Gacy was transferred to the Menard Correctional Center where he remained on death row for 14 years. After his incarceration, Gacy read law books and filed voluminous motions and appeals, although he didn't prevail in any of them. After the U.S. Supreme Court denied Gacy's final appeal in October of 1993, the Illinois Supreme Court formally set an execution date for May 10, 1994. On the morning of May 9, 1994, Gacy was transferred by helicopter from Menard Correctional Center to Stateville Correctional Center in Crest Hill, Illinois, to be executed. Some of the family members of the victims drove the three hours from Chicago to Stateville for the execution, even though they knew they wouldn't be witnessing it. At that time, only Louisiana allowed relatives of the victims to witness executions. Instead, the 50 slots would be allotted to the media and law enforcement, some of whom were DAs Bill Kunkel and Bob Egan, and investigator Greg Badeau. When some of the family members arrived, they found the grounds mobbed by onlookers and media, as well as those protesting the death penalty. James Stapleton and his family, finding they couldn't drive through the mob, decided to turn back and head home. As Gacy's execution time approached, there were parades in downtown Chicago and a rally at the Daly Center, where 33 mock body bags represented the victims. On May 10, 1994, John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown, was executed by lethal injection. 
At 12.58 a.m., John Wayne Gacy was pronounced dead and was cremated, with his remains turned over to his sister. After the remains of all victims had been recovered, the house had been so weakened that it was barely standing. It was raised on April 10, 1978. The lot stood empty for years, with it being a hangout for kids and curiosity seekers. Finally, in 1986, the land was purchased by a local woman who built a new home for her retired parents. In 2019, the house was put up for sale for $459,000, with no mention of the land's history in its listing, which isn't required by Illinois state law. However, the realtor must give the history of the property to potential buyers if asked. As you can well imagine, there were no tears for this clown. While researching, I found it sad that all the focus was on Gacy and very little on the victims in this tragedy. They just became a series of numbers, but they were more than just that. They were young men and boys whose lives were cut short by an evil man. In a follow-up to this video, I'll attempt to tell their stories. Remember to subscribe to my channel and ring that notification bell so you can be notified when that next video drops.